We cannot have all the big businesses of the world run by bros from San Francisco. Julia Elliott Brown, serial entrepreneur, keynote speaker, founder of Enter the Arena and best-selling author of Raise. She's here to give you straight-talking advice to female founders on how to secure investment. If we wait for the change to happen organically, we're going to still be sitting here in 100 years' time. If you're seeing a, a venture capital firm that is doing nothing but seeing male founders, that needs to be exposed. Not enough women are taking that leap to go out and raise investment. Once you flip the switch in a female founder's mind that, that they can do that, they're like, oh, okay, let's go. That's what VCs love, is game changers. Someone who's going to kind of make a new market and be a real leader in it. With Upper Street, what happened? Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. You did it. You got the show to 1,000 subscribers. And if you're a regular and you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button. Let's get to 2,000 subscribers. And I promise you, I'll get even more amazing guests. Let's do it. Julia, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Really good to see you. You've written a book called Raise, which is a book about helping female entrepreneurs raise investments. And it's no secret that female founders receive much less investment than their male peers. So what are the stats? Well, the headline stats are that female founders receive less than 2% of venture funding. So it's a pretty bad headline stat, but there's a lot that sits behind that. And I think we have to be careful that that statistic doesn't then become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because if all we talk about is the negative stats, women are going to look at that and go, well, what chance have I got of raising investment? I think I'm going to give that a miss. And, and then we're going to have a problem because we need more women funding their businesses and scaling them and building the businesses of the future so that we have a better diversity in the world we live in. So they are pretty bad, but there's a lot that sits behind that. Um, and actually, in some areas, women are, are, are doing quite well. I think with angel funding, women are much more successful at securing angel investment from like individuals that, that put money in. It is definitely more tricky when, you come, when it comes to raising investment in venture capital firms. Oh, that's so. interesting. I did not hear that stat in terms of women getting or being more successful with angels. Why is that? Um, I think it's partly because of the kinds of businesses that women build and the fit with those kind of investors. So venture capital firms are really looking for the next unicorn. They're looking for tech businesses that they can pump some money into that will scale really fast, get really huge and exit really quickly. And actually, a lot of women aren't building businesses like that. They're building uh, product-based businesses. Um, they're building businesses in the kind of um, social and community space, beauty, fashion, um, less women building tech businesses that fit with that VC model. And angel investors tend to be a bit more patient. So that's why it's called patient capital. They'll back founders that they believe in. They'll be happy to wait much longer to get a return on investment and their requirements for how much return they get will be a bit more modest than the VCs. So it tends to be a better fit. Um, but one of the issues we have is not just around the fact that, you know, it's the industry's fault that they're not investing in women, but we also see that not enough women are, are going for it. Not enough women are, are taking that leap to go out and raise investment. How much does the self-fulfilling prophecy play into women not entering the arena as your business name implies, and actually not going for it? Uh, I think it has a massive impact. Um, it, so it puts people off. Women look at the, the ecosystem and they kind of go, wow, like all these, all these investors are men. And I didn't build my business um, to then go into a situation where I've kind of got the men in suits coming to kind of tell me what to do. So they kind of have that, that perception. And actually, that's a bias in itself. We talk a lot about gender bias in the, in the industry, but I think a lot of female founders can go into this situation with their own biases about what investors are going to be like. And um, they'll also go into uh, um, this, a situation where they're thinking about raising investment, expecting to experience gender bias. So if you go into a situation expecting 
people to kind of be against you because you're a woman, you're going to be looking for that. And I see a big difference um, with female founders who come from a very male industry or female founders that have done STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, maths, to those women who come from a more creative um, uh, background, is those women who've, who've come from those kind of more male-dominated industries who then become female founders, they're used to dealing with this kind of very male-dominated in, uh, uh, environment. And so, and, they, and they've and they succeeded anyway in that industry. So they come into the world of raising investment, they kind of go, well, why should it be any different? Because I'm a woman, of course, it's going to be fine. Whereas when you come from a background where you've never experienced this kind of the world of finance and, and guys in suits, it feels really foreign. And so you look at that and you think, oh my God, they're so different from me. I don't understand them. It's kind of like a them and us. And I feel like I'm going to be discriminated against. And so it, it causes that kind of massive gap between investors and founders, which is really not good. Mm. And one of my missions really in terms of supporting um, amazing, ambitious women in raising investment and growing their businesses is to help them bridge that gap. Because that's what it is often. It's a communication gap. It's a connection gap. More than anything, it's about humans understanding each other. And if you can find a good fit between founders and investors that come to the middle and understand each other, then you can do great business. Mm. But if you're going into it feeling like you're not in a position of power, feeling that the investors on the other side of the table are the ones that control everything and are all powerful and, and they're going to discriminate against you because you're a woman, it's the wrong mindset to be going into it with. Mm, no, totally agree with that. And on that point, there is something that women can do. Likewise, investors can also do their part. So it's not just one or the other. So let's just start with the female founder. What can they do to ensure that their chances of getting the investments are higher? This episode is sponsored by HVO Search, a specialist executive search and talent advisory firm helping founders, CEOs, and HR directors hire the most in-demand and best C-suite talent. Tired of seeing the same old CVs and uninspiring candidates? Reach out to me, Maria Borostovsky, to find out how your business can skyrocket with the best talent. So let's just start with the female founder. What can they do to ensure that their chances of getting the investments are higher? Well, raising investment is not easy, uh, let's face it. There's a lot of skills you need to be good at raising investment. So the first thing is about empowering yourself with those skills. To be successful, you've got to have a, a great business that is investable. So that's the first thing is really understanding whether you have an investable business. And I see a lot of founders out there perhaps going out and trying to raise investment for a business that probably isn't investable. So what do you mean by that? So we, we, let's define what yes. uninvestable <laughs> business is. Well, a, an investable business is one that is um, solving a real and pressing problem for its customers that has the potential to scale quite significantly, that has a, a really strong team, uh, a strong founder and a strong management team that can grow that business. Um, and a business that ultimately one day could sell, could exit. Because when investors put their money into your business, they're looking to make a return on investment. So if you're the kind of business that um, is going to grow very slowly and organically and, and, and is going to be quite hard to sell, investors aren't going to be really interested because they can't make a return on their money. They'd be better off putting their money in the bank or into bonds or in property. So that's an investable business, one that is has got this potential to be a lot bigger and one day exit. That's the kind of fundamentals. Can you talk about numbers? Like what kind of numbers are we talking about? What investors are expecting a very successful scale-up business to achieve? Yeah. I mean, a good rule of thumb is to think about a 10 times return on investment over a five to seven year period. It will be different for every investor. Everybody has their own investment criteria. But all investors know that they're going, they'll, they place bets, basically. So for every 10 companies that they back, a couple of them are going to be really successful, a couple of them are going to fail, and quite a lot in the middle are going to just kind of flatline. And so they're placing their bets, and they're looking for that, 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 that bet that is going to give them that 10 times return on investment because they know that probably quite a lot of their investments 
aren't going to give them a return, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting. So the female founders need to understand the perspective of the investors. They need to know that 10 times the investment value, that's what they need to be projecting. Mm -hmm. And what are female founders doing wrong when it comes to those things now? I think a lot of it is that they don't really understand how investors think. Mm -hmm. And that's understandable because why would you unless you've empowered yourself to understand how they think? So I would say, you know, we get hundreds of female founders coming to enter the arena wanting support and advice and probably 90% of them, I would say, you know, you're not, your, your business isn't ready. You're not really investable. There's more work you need to do to get your business at a point where it is ready. I, I think it's it's easy mistake to make because we see lots of stuff in the media. I'm like, oh my God, these businesses raising all this money and that's what I've got to do. So founders think that's the first thing I've got to do is go and raise money. But they may be only, you know, only doing 30, 50,000 pounds turnover a year. They haven't really got that many customers. They haven't really found product to market fit. They can't really demonstrate that there's this big market out there for what they do. And, and they don't really understand that that's what investors are looking for. So they'll kind of go to all these networking events, wanting to meet investors, and they're not ready for it yet. And, it, and it's such a, a waste of their energy and time. They would be far better focusing on getting their, biz, getting their business kind of in good shape mm-hmm. before they go out and, mm-hmm. and raise. But that's the, that's the first step. That's the first thing is, have you got this business that actually investors might want to back? And I mean, I'll give you some more stats kind of, of, of companies that go out to find funding, but something between one and 2% will be successful. Okay. That's a quite a low success rate. And this is across male founders, female founders, across, across the, the board. board. Across the board, which just shows you that actually only the very, very best companies, only the top one, two percent are going to get funded. And I don't think enough founders across the board realize that. So, and then everybody's surprised when they can't raise investment. The reason you can't raise investment is that only the very best do. Mm. So what else must you pay attention to? So, you know, know the language of the investor, look at how your business can scale and provide that 10 times return. What else? So that's, that's the business proposition, but that's only the start. That's kind of getting to first base of climbing Mount Everest, right? Because actually it's also about how you approach the whole raising investment process, which is at the end of the day, a sales process. You're a business, you're trying to find someone who will buy a share of your company in return for cash. So you're you're selling something. And so to sell something effectively, you've got to have all of the the, the tools to demonstrate to them what a great opportunity it is. So you've got to have your financials looking really strong. Um, So really good financial forecasts. You've got to understand how to value your company. You've got to make sure that you're raising the right amount of money at the right time. And these things are not always straightforward to get your head around. And, and you need to be really financially literate to be able to talk through that stuff with investors. So that's kind of you know, the next step. You also need to be a really strong communicator. So again, this, this, this talking the language of investors, understanding how to position the narrative of what you're doing, uh, how to really reflect the true value. So being a strong communicator both in terms of written presentations, emails, how you talk about your business on LinkedIn, also really, really critical. And this is just the preparation stage. Then you're talking about actually finding the right kind of investors that will, that will um, be a good fit for your business and knowing how to do that. That isn't always easy. And again, lots of founders will be going to all these networking events and and that's a scattergun approach. You know, you go to an event where there's a couple of hundred people. How do you know that your your perfect investor is in the room? They're probably not going to be. Again, a lot of time and energy wasted on trying to find investors in the in the wrong way. So how would you go about picking who the right investor is for you? Like what criteria do you need to keep in mind? Well, it's partly about kind of understanding how much how, so how much money you want um, and the valuation of your business, which is going to inform 
the type of investor that might be interested in you. So are you thinking about angel investors? Is it venture capital firms? Is it crowdfunding that might be right for you? Um, could it be a family office? You know, there, there are lots of different types of investors. And the type of investor you go for will depend on on those things, like how much you're raising. Um, but also kind of do they do you need particular expertise? Do they need to understand your business? And this is about finding people where you're pushing on open doors. So if an investor gets what you do, it's going to be much, much easier to build that connection. Um, so I'll give you a, a good example. I, I know we'll, we'll talk about my last business um, a little later, but my last business was a, was a fashion tech company where you could design your own shoes. So it was all about shoes. My, cl- my customers were all women. And, f- and finding investors that got that was quite challenging because if you're talking to men, the reaction I would get would be, well, do women really spend that much money on shoes? <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> Whereas if you're talking to a female investor, um, back then there were very few of those, it's a very different conversation immediately. And so particularly if you look around, you know, the, the femtech businesses that are, that are doing great things, you know, stuff that's going on in the menopause, uh, puberty, all those kind of areas it's quite hard to find investors that in, that inherently get that. It doesn't mean you can't communicate the value of your business, but it just you've got a few more hurdles to cross. Whereas if you find a, an investor who kind of has experienced the problem that you're solving or knows someone close to them that, that has, you're instantly in the door. They feel mm. a connection. And that, that's the thing is investors, they invest with their head and their heart. And you've got to get the the heart bit first, you've got to get the emotional connection before you can then talk about the more rational and logical reasons about why investing makes sense. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, me as a headhunter, thinking about how can you help candidates to figure out where would be the right place for them in terms of you know either finding a great boss or a company culture that really resonates with them. As a female founder, how, well, there's two parts to this question. How can you find out who would be the right investors for you desk research through desk research (laughs) and then the second part to that question when you are in the room with them what signs do you need to look for to figure out is there an understanding here great questions i mean the first one yes there's a lot of desk research you can do so the first thing is getting really clear on you know the profile of your ideal investor what does that look like what does your dream investment team look like and then you can start to think about the, who the people might be that would fit that. Um, and particularly for early stage businesses where you're looking for angel investment, angel investors are, are everywhere, actually. It's not like they necessarily have angel investor as their job title, although there are people that do have that. Mm-hmm. But most angel investors don't put that as their job title because they're doing something else. They might be a successful entrepreneur who's already built and exited their business and now has money to put back into other companies. They might be somebody who works in the corporate world who's got a very successful corporate career but likes to put some of their money into venture. Um, It might be somebody who's in your industry who really gets what you do and loves it and wants to be part of it. So it's it's thinking about that quite laterally. Um, You know, who are the the, the, the type of people who might be interested in backing your company. And actually that desk-based research can be done then on places like LinkedIn. And if you're thinking about like, if you're building a, you know, a fashion brand and it's in a particular space like sustainable, sustainability, let me think, right, who, what are the other companies I know that have been successful in that space? Who are the people that led those? Could I reach out to them, build a connection, get some rapport going, and maybe they'd be interested in investing. So it's all about it's all about people and relationships at the end of the day. Mm. No, I'm totally with you on that because leveraging your network is what I call when I help with some career coaching in terms of how can you take direct control over your own business development for your career. And the same thing applies to founders looking for investors. Like who who do you know who you can speak to that might be able to put you in touch with someone else? But it does come back to knowing what you need first and then going out and looking for it. Um, You mentioned having the scatter 
shotgun approach of going to networking events, thinking that you're productive, but you don't necessarily know that the investors are there. And this may be a loaded question, but do you think women are not good at networking? Um, I think that often women don't know how to network. It's not that they can't be good at it. In fact, women are excellent networkers if they do it strategically. And that's the thing, you have to do it strategically. There's no point in going to an event where you have no idea who's going to be there and just hoping that randomly you might meet somebody. So it's much more about, again, knowing the kind of people that you're looking for, where they might be, and figuring out how you, you can find them. And they may not be at those events that, that you, you see plastered all over the internet. Mm. That's the thing. Um, and I think it's an excuse I hear a lot from female founders is that, well, I, ca I can't find investors because I don't have a network. And it's not fair because men have a network. And I don't buy that. Um, and I think for anybody who wants to be successful in business, whether that's in the corporate world or whether as an entrepreneur, you, networking is something that you have to do. And as an entrepreneur and a business leader, that is a, that is a core skill. So the earlier you get to, to build that network, the better. And as a founder, if you're creating a business that's doing something different, that's really pushing the envelope, really trying to change things, you need that network of people who are in your industry, who've done it before, who might get it, even if it's not about raising investment, these are people that you should be building connections with because the value that they're going to bring to you as an entrepreneur is huge. You could, should never be building your business in a little silo. You've got to get out there and talk to people about it. So if you're doing that from the start and as you go along, when it comes to raising investment, you find that you've already got a, a head start. Um, but if you haven't got that network, it doesn't mean you can't start to build it, even if you're ready to raise investment now. So we just have to get out there and do it. Mm. Going back to the second part of that question in terms of, so you're sitting across the table or you met somebody at an event, you're talking to the investor, you think that might be the right one. What should you be looking out for to, or even what questions should you be asking mm. to understand if that's the right investor for you? Well, I think the first thing is to see it as a conversation, not a pitch. We hear all this stuff about pitching, pitching, pitching as an entrepreneur. And so there's this feeling that I'm going to go into the room with the investor. I'm just going to get my PowerPoint out. I'm just going to pitch. <laughs> and that's where we go wrong because actually it should be a conversation. And it's as much as you learning about that investor as them learning about your business. So the first thing is about doing your background research on that person so that you've got a little bit of a sense of them before you even get in the room. The second thing is about building rapport because once you build that rapport, you can start to open up some honesty and some vulnerability and, and get proper answers to questions. Before you even start doing your pitch, you know, asking that investor, oh, so what's your experience in investing? What kind of businesses have you invested in before? How has that gone? What were the things where it went wrong? What are the best entrepreneurs that you've worked with? Some questions like that can really flesh out what they're like as an investor and what their concerns and challenges might be. And you can ask them, you know, what, what made you interested in, in having this discussion with me? What's going to pique their interest? So the, even before you start pitching the business, <laughs> those questions to ask. And then as you're going through talking about your business, you're talking about the, the, the problem that you see in the market, your, your solution, um, the, you know, the business model, how you're planning to take it to market, all of those things, is at every point that, you're, talk, that you're, you're, you're making is to check in with that investor. What do you think about that? Does that make sense to you? Does that resonate? rather than doing your whole pitch and at the end just sort of sitting there and, and waiting to see what happens. You're taking them along that journey with you. And if at any point you're getting resistance from them, that they don't really believe that there's a problem to be solved here or they just don't see how you can scale, you've got to solve that problem there and then before you move on because otherwise there's no point in finishing the rest of your pitch. There's no point in asking for money. You've got to get them convinced throughout the conversation. Mm. I feel like this is something that women are good at in terms of asking questions, having conversation rather than directly going to a pitch. Mm. Would you say that's the case? Mm. Yeah, mm. I, I think so. And actually, once you 
flip the switch in a female founder's mind that, that they can do that. They're like, oh, okay, well, I'm really good at doing that, so let's go. Mm-hmm. But I think it's, again, that, that perception, because that's what we hear about in the market, all we hear about is pitch this, competition this, mm-hmm. you know, that, 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 that the women think that's how we're gonna, we've got to do it, but we don't. So let's look on the investor side mm-hmm. to readdress the balance of having more funds going to female founders. Mm-hmm. What should investors be thinking about? I mean, I think for investors, they need to be looking at how they can strip out bias at all stages of the investment process. And I think that's that's fundamentally all it is about, actually, because if they can strip out that bias, they will find all of a sudden that they get a much better diversity of founder coming through the pipeline. And traditionally, investors have kind of, they found pe- companies to invest in through their networks. And surprise, surprise, if you're a, a guy who's a partner at an investment firm, your networks tend to be made up of other guys and and they know guys who are running startups um, and they might meet over beers and that's kind of how business was always done. So we have to get out of that, that, that kind of everything being done through established networks and make it easier for female founders to approach those investors. They put up a lot of blocks. They put up a lot of blocks. But where you see um, investment firms doing that, they have great success in, in attracting uh, diversity. So if you look at a firm like Ada Ventures, who I really rate, run by Czech Warner, they, they make such an effort to go out to where founders are. And they, t- they have scouts across the whole of the country. Um, as opposed to the traditional model where you've got, you know, male founders sitting in their kind of ivory towers in Mayfair waiting for the founders to find them. Completely different approach. So you've got to go to where the founders are. And the great female founders are often not found in Shoreditch at WeWork because, you know what, they they live in the home counties, they live up north, they're busy bringing up their family as well as building their business. They haven't got time to be going to all these kind of investor networking events or coming down to London, but they're being overlooked. So going out to where the founders are is really, really important. As you're move, as these investors are moving founders through the pipeline, the decision-making pipeline about from meeting a founder to hearing their pitch to deciding whether they're going to invest is, is having more diversity in the in the decision-making process. So again, if you've got a team of all white guys, you're not gonna get diversity of thinking. So more more effort and energy spent on bringing more women, more um, people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities. Um, that's what we need in investment firms to really get that kind of diversity of, mm. of thinking. That's gonna take a while. What do you think is gonna speed that up? One of the things I would like to see is measurement of diversity data being mandated, being a legal requirement. Because if it's all about measuring what matters. If we measure how many, uh, you know, the gender diversity and, and, the, and all diversity measures at the point of founders approaching an investment firm to being taken to the investment committee, to being funded, we will get much better visibility about where the issues are. And if that data is published, there's gonna start to become some competition between venture capital firms about who is doing best on diversity. And if you bring competition, you know, VCs have nothing more than competition, right? (laughs) Oh yeah. (laughs) So introduce a level of competition and introduce a kind of level of shame actually, because if you're seeing a a venture capital firm that is doing nothing but but seeing male founders, that, that needs to be exposed. And at the moment, it's a black hole. Um, and that is very, and when it's a black hole, it's very, very difficult to address the issue, mm. really. As a female founder going into pitching and looking around either the table or looking online and seeing who the faces are, is it a red flag if there aren't any female partners on the board or any diversity? What are your thoughts on that? I think it is a red flag. And I think as women, we need to step into our power on that, you know, and look at these investment firms and kind of go, okay, I'm just instantly looking at their website. Is it like a load of bros, you know, there, you know, being all cool, or is it a load of old guys in suits? If it is, is that 
is that what I'm really looking for as my partner in growing the business? Have all the businesses they've invested in been men? Often you can see their portfolio on the website. If it is, I would question that. Um, so I think it is a red flag. You know, and there is a scheme in the UK which is called the Investing in Women scheme, which at the moment is voluntary. It's voluntary for investment firms to sign up to that. Again, asking the question, have they signed up to the Investing in Women scheme, which means that they are actively looking at improving diversity. If they haven't, are they right for me? But the problem is most founders feel that they don't have the power to do that. And again, it goes back to the statistics. It goes back to knowing how few founders do get funded. They kind of look at it and they go, well, you know, if all I did was speak to the firms that have great diversity and I've invested in, have signed up to the Investing in Women Code, I'm cutting off a lot of potential investors that might have some money for me. So it's, it's challenging. Um, but I think there is a lot more that the government could be doing now to actually mandate this, because if we wait for the change to happen organically, we're going to still be sitting here in 100 years' time mm. saying the same thing. It's kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And I think about this a lot in terms of how much effort needs to be made in order to readdress the balance. And it's a catch-22. You want more women investors. You want more female partners in private equity, you want more women in tech, you want more female founders, and yet there is the bias in both directions, both from women themselves and in the senior level. So, you know, if we get more women there, then hopefully some of that will be readdressed, but they have to get there. So there's this, this everybody needs to play their part. Mm. And what I feel passionate about is that it can't be just a female problem. It's not just up to women to resolve that because you can only do so much. So men have to step up and be aware of this unconscious bias mm -hmm. as well. So I guess my question is, and maybe that's not something that's answerable because we we'll probably need a man around the table to answer that. But as an investor, how can you be aware that you are biased? What should you look out for in your own behavior or results or something tangible to say, wait a second, I think I'm being biased here? I mean, listen, we're all biased. We're human. <laughs> and if any investor says they're not biased, that's frankly a massive red flag. So by, it, by being aware of the issue and constantly questioning yourself, I think that is, that is the main thing, is questioning your assumptions and surrounding yourself with that diversity you know that's as a, as a as a male investor that's what you can actively be doing so questioning your own biases building a team around you that balances that out and actively looking at, at you know at the, the the process to strip out the bias you know those are you know those are all things that they can do mm -hmm. Why is this issue of helping female founders so important for you? Um, I mean, I think it's probably partly driven the fact that I'm a female founder myself. So I've been through this experience um, as an entrepreneur. Um, with my last business, I raised £2 million of investment for a very female-focused product. So I'd been through the process myself and it was challenging, you know, operating in a very, very male-dominated world to try and secure that investment. So I, I, I'd seen all of the challenges firsthand. And the, the level of support I felt around um, supporting female founders wasn't where it needed to be to overcome these challenges. And so that's why I feel really passionate about it, because I think I understand the issues probably much more acutely than a lot of people do having been through that process myself. And now kind of, you know, over the last eight years, I've done nothing but work with female founders to support them on, on overcoming the challenges. So I've, I've seen it all and I hear it all from the female founders mm. and, I, and I see what the issues are. But it's, the, the passion is about, not only from my own experience, but just this feeling of um, that it's not fair and we've got to level the playing field. And again, going back to my earlier point, we cannot have all the big businesses of the world run by bros from San Francisco. Mm. 
<laughs> and I don't need to name any mm-hmm. for us to know kind of what the implications of that are. You know, women make much, much better leaders. They, they you know, perform better. They produce better results. They are more likely to employ women. They are less likely to um, be corrupt. They are much more um, aware of environmental and social issues. You know, these things are proven. And these are some of the reasons why we need women building those businesses of the future. But also, let's face it, you know, more than half of the population are women. We need women building businesses that solve the problems of half that population. Mm, For sure. Where does this come from? You know, you mentioned something about it's just not fair. Mm -hmm. It's not right. Why do you care about that? Like this sense of injustice. Where does that come from for you? I don't, I don't really know. It's something I've always felt actually mm. about kind of looking after the underdog. I don't know. Maybe, I mean, I, th- I think I've always been a very strong and confident and competent person. Like from literally the minute I was born. <laughs> weirdly and I think I've always wanted to, to to be able to use that in a really good way to be able to support others um, it's, it's something that I, I you know I'm the oldest of three sisters so maybe that's part of it you know it's I was the like elder two, daughter syndrome the elder, the elder daughter syndrome have you, you know? read that book no I haven't it's really interesting it's this idea of the eldest daughter who takes on so much responsibility and is hyper achiever who you know often responsible for the siblings mm-hmm. often doing a lot of things but at the cost to herself in terms of her own you know whether it's burnout whether it's feeling deep down like n- not satisfied with life because you just have so much responsibility on your shoulders it's been a while since i've read it so i probably need to relook at that but it really stuck with me because i'm the eldest daughter mm. and i felt very seen by that book so i wonder if it is something to do with probably the I, mean, I, know, order. I, know some, I know some of the principles i've not read the book but i think i absolutely fit that profile mm. yeah Let's talk about your business, Upper Street. Apart from the fact that it's very close to my house, (laughs) the name, also shoes, obsessed with shoes myself, fashion tech business, obsessed with fashion tech. So really curious to hear your story about how you started it, why you started it, and then everything that happened. Yes. How long have you got? (laughs) As long as it takes. (laughs) I'll try and tell the sort of truncated version of it. Mm. I mean, this, it, the story kind of starts back in, I think it was 2009. Um, my sister and I were having dinner just in a restaurant just off Upper Street, actually, just around the corner from here. Mm. Um, so my sister lives in Hong Kong. Okay, this, and this is an important part of the story. And she was over visiting. And I looked at her shoes and I said, oh, I really love your shoes. Where did you get them from? Like the classic female sister question Mm -hmm. she's like oh I had them made for me in this little place in Hong Kong they're amazing and my sister's got quite big feet she hates me telling this part of the story (laughs) but she's got size nine feet and um so she couldn't buy shoes in Hong Kong because everybody has really small feet there and and it's quite a common thing out there to have bespoke um shoes made so she would go into the little shop and she would you know choose the shape of the the shoe, the heel height, and then look through all the material books and, and um, you know, the colours and does she want a bow on it or a strap and kind of sketch it out. And then, you know, a few weeks later, these amazing shoes would arrive, like the elves and the shoemaker. Mm. <laughs> and um, and I just was like green with envy. I was like, oh, my God, I want to design my own shoes. I want one of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And for me, you know, I'm one of these people that always go shopping for shoes and I can never find the shoes that I have in my head. Mm-hmm that are going to go with a certain outfit or a certain look. So um, that's where the idea came from. So we were over dinner. There may have been a couple of bottles of wine involved in this. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> but we literally kind of scribbled it all out on a couple of sides of A4. And um, and our working name for it was The Elves and the Shoemaker, actually, because it's one of our favourite fairy tales as, as kids. Um and we kind of, you know, we let it sort of ruminate a bit. And then we thought, actually, maybe there is something in this that we could 
create a business that will enable women all over the world to design their own shoes. My background was um, running consumer businesses, data. The two things kind of came together. My sister was out in Hong Kong doing an operational role for a big investment bank out there and, and wanted to leave because she was wanted to have children. And we just thought, yeah, if you could create the, you know, actually design the shoes online and then order them and have them delivered to your door, how amazing would that be? So that's where the idea mm. came from. And so we spent um, probably the best part of a year working on the business plan, um, talking to lots of people about it, doing research with our friends mostly over pizza to see if they thought it was a good idea. Um, and then we just thought, you know, we've got to do this because it sounds like a great idea. And so we did. It's amazing. I mean, <laughs> yeah. every girl's dream is to design her own shoes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I speak for us all, but uh, <laughs> talk me through those early stages. So you've come up with a plan, you've got the idea, mm. then what? I mean, lots of pieces of the puzzle had to be brought together because for a start, neither of us knew anything about making shoes. We knew nothing about fashion beyond the fact that we liked going shopping. Um, we knew nothing about shoe design. We didn't really understand about kind of fashion PR. We, we weren't technical, so we couldn't build the technical solution. So we had to go out and find the best people to fit in all those bits of the puzzle. Do you think this was an advantage or do you think this was a disadvantage? A massive advantage because people who are already in, in the industry, but like, well, you just can't do that. That doesn't work like that. Um, you never make that work. And my answer to that is always like, well, why not? <laughs> and we're going to dig into it um, because we thought there was a way and there was a way. But it was cha it was challenging, you know, finding, um, I mean, sh you know, finding a great shoe designer, you know, fortunately was somebody who was connected to me through a friend I knew, an amazing woman called Rosa Fior, who has, also lives in Islington, um, who became our shoe designer. Finding good tech resource. Again, that was within my skill set. I'd, I'd, I'd run a consumer website before where I'd work with tech people. Um, but the shoe, the shoe production bit, you know, my sister had to deal with that. And she was going over to China and um, talking to lots of potential suppliers about, could you make shoes for us one by one, bespoke? Um, and they're like, who, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> and yes, we can make shoes, but normally it's a minimum order quantity of a thousand, you know. So quite a lot of persuading at that end to get people to do it in a new way. But, you know, we did get them on board and managed to make that happen. So a lot of that, I think we didn't, we knew we didn't know this stuff. That was the skill I think that both of us had as quite experienced businesswomen already before we started the business. We knew we didn't know it. We knew we couldn't wing it. We had big ambition. So we were like, we're going to have to find the best people. And that's what we did. So that was the first bit, it's finding the best people who could do all those things. And we funded it ourselves at the start. But How we, did you, you know, fund it? Um, through savings. Uh, my sister took a redundancy, which was quite convenient. Um, so that was the early days. We took out our business loan. Um, and then we did get to a point where we needed to secure, secure investment. And I think we didn't probably realise at the beginning that we would need to do that. I think we were probably, well, not probably, we were overly optimistic, as entrepreneurs often are, about how quickly we could reach break even. And we didn't know enough really about what it would take to um, be successful as a consumer, a new consumer brand in the footwear industry where you've got competitors with very deep mm. pockets. So needed quite a lot of funding really to be successful. So I don't think we realised quite the extent of how much funding it would need, but it's, it became apparent quite quickly. So yeah, then we, we raised investment through angel investors. Mm -hmm. And how much did you raise initially? Initially, I think well, our first round was probably a couple of hundred, which was through um, per, uh, personal connections. And then we raised investment from venture capital, uh, two venture capital firms. And that was 750,000. Um, one of them followed them followed on with their money. We also crowdfunded. That we were the first UK fashion brand to crowdfund, which was quite an experience. Um, mm. So, you know, from all, all sources, all sources. You know. So take me back to the process of pitching to VCs, mm. what you learned from that. Talk me through how you approached it then, mm. not knowing the things you know now. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so there were kind of two phases to this. The first phase was when I didn't really know what I was doing and went out to talk to all these big VC firms. And to cut a long story short, the resounding feedback was kind of come back when you've got more traction, which is a very common thing that happens. To be, to be honest with you, we weren't ready for those kind of VCs. They were what's called Series A VCs. So they want to put in kind of three, five million pounds plus. And we were reasonably small at that point. We weren't ready for them. Mm. And we did have interest from two of the biggest five VC firms who they were like, this is, we want to take this to America. You know, you're going to need to probably move over there. Um, we're going to, you know, you need to scale this really fast. And we got a bit excited. And then we just thought, hang on, hang on a minute. This is... Um, we're not ready for this. We don't, we don't know enough about our customers. We didn't mm. feel we'd we'd proved enough to kind of to go that fast. So and it didn't feel right. In terms of meeting those VCs mm. who have obviously agreed to see you, so they must have seen something in your business plan to ignite that spark, mm. to be, you know, willing to hear your story. So was it that you realized that you were not ready mm. or they were expecting to hear something else from when you went to pitch to them. Mm. What do you think it was? Well, it was a mix. So we had a couple of VCs who were like, we want to do this and go big and put lots of money into it. Mm -hmm. We weren't ready for that. But the but the other the other VCs were kind of come back when you've got a bit more traction because mm -hmm. they weren't sure. But the reason they wanted to have the conversation with us is we were doing something really different that hadn't been done before. And I think that's what VCs love is, is game changers. And someone who's going to kind of make a new market and be a real leader in it. And they could see that we were doing a really good job of it. You know, we were having great success, amazing press coverage, you know, really some high profile customers. And, uh, you know, our, the way we were running that business was done quite professionally. We had really you know, good, good financials, a good plan, because we kind of were quite competent in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. um, lots of stuff we didn't know. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> but they could see that we were, you know, good people. You know, and I think that's the thing is th those investors kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's not just about having an investable business. You've got to be a really investable founder. And I think that was the bit they were really interested in is us as founders, because they could see that we were, we had great potential. So even if we hadn't quite got the concept perfect yet they believed in us more than anything what do you think you've shown them mm. that made them believe that you were investable founders um the way we'd approached it so the fact that we had brought in the very best people around us was one of the things that we um were very structured about our approach and had a, a real plan for growth the the quality of our execution they saw that um they saw the team that we built and the quality of that team, but also the loyalty they had to us. Um, you know, at the point where we were raising investment, we'd had to really cut back um, on costs because things were getting quite tight. And I remember talking to the team about it, saying, you know, things are really tricky and, um, you know, we might have to let a couple of you go. And they were like, no, 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 no. We'll work. We'll take a pay cut. We'll work part time because we believe in this. And I was actually blown away by that. It's not something I asked them to do. The team asked to do that, mm. you know, and, and the investors knew that at the time. Mm. So, you know, that, that I think was the thing that they were really interested in is, is, is seeing our, how capable we were and the fire we had in our belly mm. and how we were bringing really great people along with us. Mm. So the, there were two phases to this. The first phase when we kind of went out not really know what we were doing, talking to investors, the wrong kind of investors who were too big for us, those kind of Series A investors. It wasn't right. And so I kind of went went back and, and re-looked at the whole proposal, looked at what we needed to raise, and then went back out to raise investment, feeling much more confident about the amount we wanted to raise and what we wanted to do, and, and very quickly secured investment that when I came on that second phase of trying to raise, because... The, the way I felt about it at that point was just like, this is what we're doing. We're on this, we're on this path. If you like what we're doing, hop on the train, let's go. Whereas the first time I went out to raise investment, it was kind of like, oh, 
you know, don't really know about investment. I'm not sure if we really need it. Uh, wow. Um, mm. Quite a different power dynamic. And again, I think that was a key to us securing that investment when we went back out is that they saw that absolute confidence and belief and certainty that we had. What did you find out that you didn't know about raising funds as a founder mm. during that time? Because you're talking about you didn't realize how much cash you'd need, mm. um, how much competition mattered in the sense that they had more resources, more funds, mm. and in order to make the business work that it needed to have that extra cash. What, what else surprised you or what else did you learn the hard way? Mm, gosh, so many learnings. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't realize how important fundraising would be uh, as part of my role as the CEO of that company. And it was, you know, it was all encompassing at times. So the skills I needed, I didn't realize how, how important they would be. Um, I, you know, I learned so much around, around financial forecasting and valuation and equity and, and all about kind of when you're raising investment, it's not just about how much investment you need now. It's about thinking about what investment you might also need in the future and planning your investment journey strategically. I really learned about that. Mm. Really important. I think a lot of founders don't don't realize that. In your book, you said, I think you were talking about having six month runway. Mm. Do you still believe that's enough? Not in today's climate. Mm. I don't think it is enough. Um, you can raise investment in four to six months. But the thing is, if that's all you've got as a window, you are really going to be like a rabbit in the headlights. So what runway do you need now in the current climate? I would give yourself at least a year. Mm -hmm. And that's quite hard for most founders to, to think about because that actually means you need to have quite a lot of money still sitting in the bank when you're going out to raise, but at least 12 months. And actually nowadays, it's, it's almost like the you're always raising. You know, and that's the sad truth of it. You've just finished one round. You're probably thinking about the next. Mm. And th th that is the reality of the situation. So get, how, get your head around that. And how does that impact you as a CEO? Because one part of your job is to run the business, make sure everything is working, and the other is raising funds. And if you're constantly raising, then that takes you away from the business as well. Mm. So how do you balance that? Well, I think it's about raising effectively. So we talked earlier about, you know, building out that network and that groundswell of support for you and your business right from the get go. Because if you've got that, then when you need to raise investment, you just kind of tap into it. OK, same with subsequent rounds. If you are managing your, your current investors really well and demonstrating great results and you are managing prospective investor relationships just as an ongoing activity, when it comes to doing the next round, you turn it on. Now, it's not, I'm not saying you turn it on and the money flows in. But you know what? For some businesses, if they're doing a great job, it does. It really does. Mm. So actually, yes, the focus on the business is just as important. If you're building a great business, the investors are attracted to that. So you, you've got to do both. Um, but if you've got a great network, you're managing the relationships just as a constant and are building a great business, the investors should come. How do you do that? So how, how do you nurture your investor network mm -hmm. without pitching and without raising funds? Mm -hmm. What tips can you give to founders on how to do that? Um, I think LinkedIn is a fantastic tool that everybody should be using more and embracing more. Because again, it's creating that your... your, your you're spreading the news about what you're doing as a business to a wider audience all the time if you do it well. So you don't. it's not like you have to be having meetings with all those potential investors. A lot of them are there in that space following you um, on a social media platform. So social media, using that really effectively, um, using email marketing effectively. So if you're building up a database of, of existing and prospective investors thinking about you know, how you can continue to communicate with them in an honest and open way about what's going on with the business mm. um, so that you're keeping them engaged. So it's a, it's a communication exercise more than anything. How frequently can you do that? So say email marketing, like how frequently 
can you keep investors up to speed with what's mm. going on? I think it depends if you've got some good stuff to say. Mm. Um, I mean, I think monthly is fine. Quarterly may be also okay. It depends mm. on the, the speed of growth of your business and what's going on. Yeah, there's no point in doing a monthly newsletter if there's not something fabulous you can share with them. And you're talking about that exclusively for investors or who else could be part of your marketing list, so to speak? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not just investors. It's other people in the ecosystem, other founders. What you're trying to build, again, is that, is, that, is that groundswell, that kind of positive feelings about your business and what you're doing and bringing people along with you. And so using whatever communication methods are, are, are right for those, those audiences. So you've got to, again, go back to understanding who's your audience, how do they like to be communicated with, and how can I keep that up? Mm. You know, there may be some key investors where you think, you know what, that's somebody that I want to have a call with once a quarter. Or maybe I want to have lunch with once a year because they're interested in what I do. I'm not big enough for them yet, but I will be at some point in the future. So how about we have a, you know, an annual lunch where we talk about what we're doing? Mm. So thinking strategically about that and having an investor relations plan is really important. Again, most founders don't do it. Um, they finish their first raise and they kind of go, thank Lord for that. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> Never again. I don't ever want to talk to investors again. Mm. Great. I'm going back to building my business. Mm-hmm. Very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Because guess what? You're probably going to be raising again sooner than you think. So it never stops, unfortunately. So with your business, Upper Street, how soon did you need to raise again? Oh, it's going back a while now, but I think it was probably quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, It might have been within six to eight months. um, And we were going back to our our VCs for follow-on funding, which they were happy to provide because they could see we were making good progress. They had anticipated it. Most VCs know, know that you're going to need follow-on funding. Um, so very quickly, we were going back out to them. Probably within 18 months, we were out doing a, a crowdfund. You know, so it, was, it, was, it did feel a bit um, continuous. Mm. Yeah. With crowdfunding, what was the experience like for you? Is it something that you felt was the right thing to do then? Or what did you learn from the crowdfunding mm. process? Um, I partly wanted to do it because it was new and I thought it was quite interesting to see, which is actually kind of the reason why I do a lot of things in my life, um, because I'm curious. We talked about it with the VCs. and Actually, this is quite interesting because um, this is about enabling our customers and our followers to be part of the journey. So we saw it as kind of more of a marketing exercise than about just about raising funds, if I'm honest with you. Mm. So, um, yeah, and it, and it was quite an experience because it was still reasonably new back then. So we were kind of, the, 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 the rule books about how to run a crowdfunding campaign certainly hadn't really been written. Um, but we took a, a very marketing-led approach about how we, how we did it. Mm. And we were quite creative about how we did it. Mm. And with Upper Street, what happened um, I mean, you know, the, the end of the story is that we closed the business. Why did we close the business? A number of things, really. One was funding. So as I talked about before, to make that business work needed a huge amount of funding. And the challenge we had um, with our two um, BC investors who came on board, one of them, uh, their fund closed, so they couldn't put any more money in. And the other one, had reached the limit of how much they could invest in us to benefit from the enterprise investment scheme. And um, both of those things were not particularly foreseen. And I hadn't got a plan B or a plan C. So when they couldn't follow on their funding when I was expecting to, it left a big hole. And actually, not enough time to fill that hole. So that was a problem. Um, but we also had another problem in the business. We did a big technical rebuild of our uh, our shoe designer. And it was a project that went double over budget, took twice as long um, to complete and, and actually had a big impact on our results. So that also shortened the window for funding. So we had kind of had those two things going at the same time, which just meant that I could see this train coming down the tunnel at me and it just kept coming and we couldn't turn quick enough to avoid Mm. it so it was just one of those things and I think as an entrepreneur and any entrepreneurs listen to this will will resonate this will resonate with you you, your luck can turn on a pinhead 
And if I think about the, the seven years we had that business, the amount of times we swerved, you know, the iceberg, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was phenomenal. And you do it, you do it, you do it. And then sometimes just, you know, too many things happen at the same time where it's just there was no there was no way out of this. I think with perspective, I look back at it and I think, you know, we were trailblazing. We were quite early in in terms of the market adoption of, of that kind of bespoke product. And we saw what happened. There was another company who we actually sold our assets to when we closed the business, who was an Ameri- uh, originally Australian company, but they moved to America because they got backed by a big um, VC fund in the States. And they'd had, you know, 30 million US funding, so a lot more funding than us. And about 14 months after we closed, they also closed. So we saw that they couldn't make it either and they'd had a lot more funding. I th- so I think market dynamics were quite tricky. Mm. It's a tricky business to make work. Footwear isn't easy. Um, no. And design your own isn't easy. There are a lot of not easies in that business model. Um, amazing that we overcame a lot of those challenges. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, it was a, it was a tricky business to scale without huge amounts of funding. Mm. I mean, one of the key skills of an, any entrepreneur, in my opinion, is also knowing when to quit and when to stop. What are your thoughts on that? I think it is um, highly sensible to understand when you're going to quit and actually set yourself a quitting target. <laughs> did you do that? Um, yes, I did. And the, 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 the quitting target was very clear and it was really about it was about the finances of the business because you cannot run a business in the red. As a director, you have a fiduciary responsibility not to do that. So that was the very obvious point about when we would quit. Um, up until that point, I wasn't ready to quit. But I think, you know, when you set those quitting targets, it makes it easier for you to understand when enough is enough. So if you're raising investment, if you set yourself a target that, you know, if I've spoken to 50 investors and I've not got investment, I'm going to stop. You know, it, it puts things into perspective and it also helps you to keep going up until the point where you know that enough is enough. And by the time we closed the business, it was absolutely the right decision and it felt like the right decision. And actually, it was an, a massive relief to me because when you were an entrepreneur building a high growth business and you are constantly fighting all of those challenges, it is exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. And I think. After seven years, it was becoming too exhausting for me. And that burnout was was very real. So would you start another footwear business? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? But what's really hard, the biggest, the hardest thing about footwear is, um, is fit. And the shoes are complex. There's a lot of components to them. So it's, it's not a straightforward business. Um, and yeah, so no, I, w- I wouldn't. I've got <laughs> money, more things I want to do. <laughs> Nothing to do with shoes. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. obviously with your business, Enter the Arena, supporting female founders, what's next for your business there? Uh, I mean, I think the focus for Enter the Arena has, has been predominantly about supporting women with raising investment. But actually, there's a lot more that, that we do to support women in scaling their businesses successfully. And um, there's a couple of things that that we're doing now with clients, which I think is going to be really um, instrumental in helping them to achieve that. One is helping them understand how to build their company to exit, which a lot of founders don't think about. They don't think about that end goal, about how much they might want to exit their business for and when. And understanding what it takes to get there and the building blocks that go into making a really valuable business uh, really, really important. So I'm doing a lot more work um, around that. And the other thing is around um, having a having a really strong board in place to help you grow that business, um, whether that's an advisory board or a formal board. That is something I also have a bit of a beer in my bonnet about now, is making sure that um, the female founders that we work with are thinking about that strategically. And it does really relate to fundraising because often people kind of, they, they have a board for the first time when they get investors and they find themselves with a board that's the founders and the investors. And that sometimes can be quite dysfunctional. But if we think about it more strategically and, and take control about building a really strong board that's going to help us get to exit, it can make all the difference. So those are the two areas that, that we're now moving into. 
Mm. Going back to what advice you would give yourself. So looking back, starting up a street and knowing what you know now, what advice would you give yourself then? I think going right back to the beginning of that that business, I probably would have spent more time consulting with others around the financial forecasts for that business because the naivety we had about what it would really take to scale from a funding perspective was, you know, created a big gap for us. Um, and I think had we known at the beginning what was involved, I mean, to be honest with you, if we'd known at the beginning, <laughs> we might not have done it. I mean, that, that naivety is sometimes quite important. Mm. So um, A lot of founders say this. Yeah, mm. exactly. Um, you know, and I don't regret building that business at all. It was fantastic. We had an, an incredible time. And I learned so much and we made a big impact for, for, you know, a lot of people's lives, creating amazing shoes. So it was, it was great. But I think, yeah, the, the, the longer term funding plan is something I wish I had looked at more carefully at the start and perhaps had a few more kind of black hat thinkers around me, you know, who could actually say, do you know what? Maybe it won't all go as well as you think it will, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that that is something I would have done again. And I think... It goes back to that point I was just saying about an advisory board. I think I was very much of that mindset when I started that business. You know, we know we don't know everything, but it felt like our energy was around bringing in the best people to work for us. And actually, had we thought about building a really strong advisory board at that point, that could have made a huge difference. So um, I do wish I had done that. Mm. Yeah. So... For female founders who might be at a relatively early stages of their business, raising their you know first VC money, what advice would you give them? Go into it with your eyes wide open. I think if you if you're going down the venture capital route, know what that means um, because if you get money from VCs, you're on a path to exit, and you better be scaling fast. Uh, and just be aware that you know not that many companies make it the statistics aren't great. So you have to be prepared for failure mm. <laughs> and know that venture is a game. Once you're on that route, it, it becomes like a game, one which, you know, you've got every chance of failing. So be prepared for that. Make sure you, you really know what you're doing. It's not that I want to put people off being entrepreneurs, but it's just understanding if you go down the VC route, you are on a, on a certain path. If you can build your business without taking on external funding or take on investors who have got more patience and can wait longer for the results. I think there is a better chance of you building a solid, sustainable business. That is my view, actually. And it's not that I'm against VC, not at all. But venture capital funding from venture capital firms isn't suited to every business. Somebody said, jokingly or not, whether women should consider seriously having a male co-founder to help to get investment what are your thoughts on that I, I don't think that should be the reason why you take on a on a male co-founder <laughs> at all <laughs> um you know it can be helpful to have a co-founder because it can be quite a lonely place building a business on your own but it's not very easy to just go out and find a co-founder most co-founder relationships are, are actually formed at the very early stages when you are founding the business. Okay, if you've already founded your business and you've been going for a year, you're no longer looking for a co-founder. You're looking for someone to come in and join your business. It's a very different thing. So um, I think it's a, it's a strange question because, you know, it's hard to go out and find a, a co-founder anyway. Mm -hmm. And no, you know, no. Don't. <laughs> Never do anything just so you can raise investment. Build the business that you want to build. And if you need funding to do that, find investors that fit what you're looking for. You know, Never do things just because you think it's what investors want to hear. Mm. Love that. Mm. Thank you. And just encouraging everyone to pick up a book called Raise yes. by Julia Elliott Brown. <laughs> Please do read the book. Honestly, mm. it will be the best... 18 pounds you ever spend mm -hmm. it's going to shortcut so many things for you and stop you from falling down all those rabbit holes um, that are very very easy to fall into um, and also if I may 
suggest, obviously, this is a podcast. If you want to hear some great stories of women who've raised investment, my podcast, which is called Fundraising Stories with Female Founders, is also really worth a listen because you're going to hear firsthand from over 75 women who have raised investment, what it really took, what they learned, the challenges they overcame. It's really inspiring. So check it out. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julia. Thank Thank you so much. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast and I'll see you in the next episode.